Today, Sam Bankman-Fried wraps up his testimony in his fraud trial. Terraform Labs co-founder Daniel Shin reportedly tries to distance himself from Do Kwon in his own trial, and Brian Mossoff of Ether Capital reacts to growing hype for crypto-focused ETFs. Welcome to CBC's Crypto World, I'm Jordan Smith. Cryptocurrencies mixed this morning, with Bitcoin taking a break from its recent gains. It's down about 1% by noon Eastern. Ether, meanwhile, down about 1.5%, while Solana gaining about 3%. Okay, let's talk about the top stories. The UK government is looking into formal legislation to regulate crypto. On Monday, it published an official response to a consultation paper from earlier this year, which laid out recommendations for regulating crypto, like stricter guidelines on custodians and risky loans. The government said in this latest statement that it intends to bring crypto under the same rules that govern banks and other financial services. And the country's financial services minister said in a statement he looked forward to, quote, making our vision a reality for the UK as a global hub for crypto asset technology. Next, Terraform Labs co-founder Daniel Shin is reportedly trying to distance himself from Do Kwon. Shin is on trial in South Korea for multiple charges surrounding the collapse of Terra Luna, charges that he reportedly denies. South Korean news outlet Manawa Broadcasting reports that Shin's lawyer said the businessman parted ways with Do Kwon for business purposes back in 2020, and that the collapse of the stablecoin and its token have nothing to do with Shin. And finally, let's pivot to the SBF trial. Sam bakeman fried took the stand once again today to wrap up his testimony. We told you about how Sam made the effort to lay out his own perspective for the collapse of FTX, including claiming much of the responsibility fell on Caroline Ellison and FTX's attorneys. Well, prosecutors got the chance to question him too, and Sam bakeman fried became less direct. A large majority of his responses to the prosecutor's questions were a simple, yep, or I don't recall. The judge even stepped in at times to ask SBF to just answer the question. Now, when asked about just how much he and the company used private jets, he did admit that he authorized spending for private planes to deliver Amazon packages to the Bahamas, but said he didn't know if he spent $15 million on private jets for his own travel. He was asked about investing in media companies too, including The Block, and whether he gave $15 million toward the CEO's purchase of an apartment. Sam started by saying he didn't know, but ended up saying, quote, we might have. When asked if he saw a spreadsheet from Caroline Ellison with seven versions of the company balance sheet, SPF said he didn't recall, despite Google metadata showing that he reviewed the spreadsheet in June of 2022. Sam also told the court he deeply regretted not taking a deeper look into the $8 billion bug that allowed Alameda to rack up so much debt. So now that Sam has wrapped up his testimony, his defense has rested and the jury has been sent home. We'll get closing arguments tomorrow. All right, for our main story, Crypto World's Talia Kaplan sat down with Brian Mossoff, the CEO of Ether Capital. They discussed moving the industry past the fall of FTX and growing bullishness around crypto ETFs. All eyes are on the trial of Sam bakeman fried right now, especially here in New York City, where the trial is taking place. And a lot of new information has come to the surface, things that we didn't necessarily know before. Of course, this trial is getting a lot of media attention, so how is this all impacting the crypto industry? I think a lot of people in the digital asset industry are ready to move past FTX. And so people want to move past this trial. They want to focus on building. They want to focus on what's next. Uh, we'd like to see regulation passed so that the crypto trading platforms that are based in the US or in other jurisdictions are able to be compliant. And so as much as people are following the case and are curious uh, just exactly what went on on the inside, I think many in the, in the industry who are good actors and, and passionate about the space um, are happy to see that this is going to be a thing of the past. Let's get rid of a bad actor or a bad set of actors. Uh, and let's focus back on, on building and making sure that these businesses uh, can operate here and be successful here um, and continue to grow the industry. Now, obviously, the collapse of FTX has led to an erosion of trust in the crypto industry, and people are still skeptical about crypto. They're still a little apprehensive about getting into crypto markets because of all the negative publicity surrounding things like the collapse of FTX. So what do you think it will take for confidence to be restored in crypto and for people to feel comfortable in investing in crypto markets? It's important for people to remember that the failure of FTX was not a problem specific to crypto or Bitcoin or Ethereum. The protocols or the assets themselves were fine. This is just a bad actor and, and a bad group of people uh, who are operating in a nefarious way. And we've seen this time and time again through traditional finance as well as the crypto industry. Uh, this was a governance problem. This was uh, an issue with lack of controls and checks and balances. And so I think as you start to see regulation form and, and local platforms figure out exactly who their 
um, regulatory body is that they're going to report to, uh, there's going to be, be more clarity and um, an understanding of what types of things will be expected from users of those platforms, uh, what regulators are going to want to see. And so that's good for the industry. The catalyst at this point to go forward, you know, what's going to bring retail sentiment back, what is going to bring institutional uh, interest back to the space, which I argue is already here. I think you have a number of catalysts on the way. One main one being the U.S. filing of a number of spot Bitcoin ETFs. And given the macro environment um, and inflation not necessarily getting as under control as central banks would want, a lot of interest is going to turn back to these assets. The value proposition of Bitcoin hasn't changed um, you know, you have something that is untethered to central banking uh, policy. It doesn't change um, the monetary policy based on the political whims or agenda of any jurisdiction. And that's very powerful. And whether it's, it's in or out of fashion year to year, if people can zoom out and look at what's happening globally and on a, a, a longer time frame, you know, five years, 10 years, they can see that what Bitcoin and Ethereum in this space offers is something very powerful, something far more native to the Internet. Uh, currency that's governed by people globally, uh, not by any agenda of one jurisdiction. And so that is going to be the catalyst coming up when you stack on the Bitcoin halving next year, which is you know a reduction in the new Bitcoin that's issued to Bitcoin miners as they solve blocks. There's a number of things that are queuing up um, you know, 2024 to be a very important year for these assets. And as the price starts to move back up, you'll see investors coming back with renewed interest. The headlines will start to shift to what the value propositions are. Um, and you know the asset class will move on. So expanding on that, I recently did a report on what could potentially spark Bitcoin's next bull run. And industry insiders I spoke with pointed to three catalysts. One was regulatory clarity. Two were those applications for spot Bitcoin ETFs. And then three was that key technical event called the Bitcoin halving. So you actually mentioned all three of them. But do you think those same catalysts can, in fact, also help catapult Ethereum into its next bull run? All of the assets are, are tethered together. You know, if one outpaces the other, that's, that's a different conversation. But I think that renewed interest in the space or a rise in, in the price of Bitcoin will also lift up Ethereum. Whether they move exactly in tandem or not, you know, we'll, we'll see. My prediction would be that they wouldn't move exactly together. I think that new dollars are going to flow specifically into Bitcoin, especially if it's through vehicles like a structured product, like these, these spot ETFs that will hopefully be approved soon in the US. So the new money is probably going to go first to Bitcoin. The other thing about Bitcoin is the narrative is very clean. Right? It doesn't have this very nuanced story of a smart contract platform and DeFi and NFTs and metaverse and what you can uh, program and move money around on the platform. Bitcoin is this very simple, hard cap, digital gold, store of value, um, neutral political form of, of money or, or asset commodity, whatever you want to bucket it into. It's very simple. For investors to buy into any of the other digital assets, they have to go a little bit further and try and understand, well, who's going to use that instead or what's the power of that protocol? So Ethereum still has a lot going for it. It always has. So far, there's been close to a billion dollars of, of revenue that's been paid to the protocol. So this is people using the Ethereum network to perform you know, various types of transactions. And they're paying a transaction fee. And they're paying those transaction fees to the validators and the people securing the network. So by all metrics, Ethereum is, is right up there with Bitcoin in terms of usage and how important it is to the ecosystem. But how the price moves relative from one to the other, we'll see over time. In 2021, your company, Ether Capital, helped launch the world's first spot Bitcoin and Ether ETFs. And now, earlier this month, we learned that Grayscale announced plans to try and convert its Ethereum trust into a spot ETF. Of course, this comes after Grayscale scored a victory over the SEC, a court victory, when uh, regarding its plans to convert its Bitcoin trust into a spot Bitcoin ETF. So what do you make of all those developments right there? I think if Grayscale or any provider who has a, a trust or a closed-end fund is able to convert those into a spot ETF, that's a win for unit holders. It's the ability for them to redeem or, or sell their shares at NAV instead of at a discount. 
Uh, and so that's that's a win for everyone. Um, there actually is risk to Grayscale in doing that because some people may decide to sell their units and, and move their dollars into a different product. Uh, but they understand that this is what's best for the investors. It's It's been a long time coming. Uh, people all understand that spot ETFs are a far more efficient product uh, for investors relative to closed end funds or futures based ETFs. And so the sooner we can get access points like spot Bitcoin or spot ETH ETFs, out into the market, that's a win for institutional and, and retail investors. Okay, that's all for Crypto World today. We'll be back again tomorrow and we'll see you then.